At this point, we should all know what a parasocial relationship is as it's been talked to death in the last few years. It's come up briefly in many of my past videos, but I thought, and many of you asked, that I do a video covering the topic in depth from my point of view. For those who don't know what a parasocial relationship is, it's a one-sided relationship where one person extends emotional energy, interest, and time into an entity or persona where the other party is completely unaware of their existence. Not all, but many fan bases have at least a few folks who suffer from engaging in parasocial behaviors. Beliebers, most Rick and Morty fans, the BTS army, Little Monsters, Disney adults, <laughs> Etc. While the term saw a significant amount of traction and interest starting around mid-2020, the term has actually been around since the 1956 paper Mass Communication and Parasocial Interaction, Observations on Intimacy at a Distance by psychologists Daniel Horton and R. Richard Wool. The concept emerged from their observations of interactions between media personalities and their audiences. It's interesting to note that they didn't point out any one individual persona at the time, but I can only assume they were probably seeing these relationships develop with people like Lucille Ball, Edward R. Murrow, Milton Berle, and Milton Berle's giant cock. <laughs> they noticed that individuals often engage with media figures as if they were part of their social circle, despite the interactions being one-sided and the media figures being unaware of, and this is an important distinction, any individual audience member. Obviously a personality and or performer knows about the existence of their fans or audience as a collective, but doesn't know any one of them on a first name basis. It becomes practically impossible to perceive the audience as anything but an amorphous Borg-like collective when you're in that position. We have engaged the Borg. When you have a large following, it can be a necessary psychological simplification to manage your scale of influence by not viewing a group as a collection of many. On the flip side, within these large audiences, individual identities become subsumed under a collective identity, which depersonalizes the relationship from the performer's perspective. See, amorphous people blob. <laughs> I only have about 5,000 subscribers right now, and if you were all standing in a giant warehouse and someone told me it was 20,000, I would think, yeah, that seems right. Uh, look at this photo of 100 people. That looks like maybe half as many to me. And this photo of a stadium of 20,000 could be 100,000, and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. At a certain point, a big enough audience becomes an abstract concept, and according to anthropologist Robin Dunbar, there's a cognitive limit to the number of people an individual can remember and maintain stable relationships with, which is referred to as Dunbar's number, and is roughly only 150 people. Which seems low when referring back to that photo of 100 people. <laughs> this collective identity creates strong bonds between the fans themselves, but can also lead to groupthink, where they might prioritize consensus over critical evaluation of alternative ideas, or develop an over-optimistic view of their collective actions and decisions. This is where these relationships become dangerous and harmful. W within the collective identity, there can be a shared belief that the group's decisions are morally superior and lead them to underestimate potential risks or criticisms and justify any unethical behavior. Even the individuals within the group who express doubt or divergent opinions may face direct pressure to conform, including social ostracism and worst case, harassment from their own peers as these groups have a tendency to turn on people who might sober up once they stop drinking the Kool-Aid. Horton and Wool's idea was influenced by the rapid expansion and evolution of television during the mid 20th century. Televisions were a brand new appliance in the 50s and quickly became widespread in households which revealed patterns of attachment and perceived intimacy between viewers and media figures. People were no longer listening to radio plays on an old RCA. They were actually able to put a face to the voice of their favorite personalities, which only reinforces feelings of closeness. Horton and Wool saw that these relationships resembled social interactions, but were fundamentally different due to their unidirectionality. Unidirectionality, that's a word, right? <laughs> Humans are very communal creatures and actively seek companionship entertainment or emotional support from the people around us. Now in the 21st century where unprecedented access to celebrities, performers, and creators of all kinds is at the tip of everyone's fingers, these personas have in some aspects replaced our neighbors, teachers, coworkers, and even close family, especially if such needs are unmet in those real world social circles or upon discovering something irreconcilable about yeah, a close peer. This may be anecdotal, but the amount of people who got divorced or disowned because of their views on vaccinations during COVID or who they voted for in 2016 left many people with a crumbling social circle 
picking out the pieces of their lives. I personally have witnessed several friends and partners and co-workers go through this over the last eight or nine years. When you feel like everyone you thought you knew turns out to have some ass backward beliefs, you can feel alone and helpless and thus search for new connections, whether that be in real life or online. It's much easier seeking that out online thanks to algorithms and hashtags that make finding like-minded people but a keystroke away. The rise of social media has also, counterintuitively, isolated millions of people, driving individuals towards parasocial interactions because in many ways, they are safer than putting yourself out there where you might suffer the pitfalls of interacting with a real person. You don't have to worry about being rejected or perceived as awkward in a parasocial relationship because you're not contributing to it in any other way than showing up or commenting on the Timothy Chalamet daily subreddit. <laughs> On a broader cultural and societal level, parasocial relationships reflect and influence social norms and values by shaping public opinion, influencing consumer behavior, and affecting social dynamics. Media figures who are the subject of widespread parasocial relationships have significant influence over these trends and culture for the better and for the worse, and still the very, Grandma very pushing. worse. <laughs> Just look at the cult of Trump to see how quickly a group endorses anything and everything he does simply by association. All of this highlights societal issues such as loneliness and tribalism and the impact of celebrity culture and the changing nature of socialization in the digital age. Obviously, I can't talk about this without citing Taylor Swift as an example, and before anyone jumps in the comments, I have other examples. I'm not going to solely shit on her or her fans who honestly scare the shit out of me. Please don't dox me. <laughs> For years, she has fostered toxic parasocial relationships with her fans to her own benefit, leading to weird cult-like behavior. <laughs> this doesn't happen in a vacuum though. She has willingly posted her personal diaries online, invited fans to her own home for listening parties where she serves homemade cookies, and leaves secret messages for them in her albums, videos, and on social media. You can't convince me this hasn't in some way affected and manipulated her fans into feeling a deep connection as though they have a real friendship with her. As Sierra Williams put in her article titled The Parasocial Relationship of Taylor Swift, Travis Kels, and Her Fans, some parasocial behaviors that some Swifties find themselves engaging in is not solely due to their machinations, but Swift's as well. Is his last name pronounced Kels or Kelsey. <laughs> this could explain why she's had 15 alleged stalkers over the years, and I'm not suggesting it's solely her fault or that she was asking for it, or that she in some way encouraged people like David Crow to show up at her home over 30 times in a three month period, but I'm sure on some psychological level, people like this who are most likely suffering from some form of mental instability, saw all this and thought, she's talking directly to me. Like how John Hinckley Jr. said he tried to kill Reagan because his dog told him to as a way to impress Jodie Foster. <laughs> the dog, honestly, should have tried harder to convince him. The stalkers aside, <laughs> Her other fans often take it upon themselves to act as a personal online security detail by sending death threats to those who even gently criticize her, like business insider's Chris Pinella. Or when Scooter Braun and Scott Borchetta, the guys who own her old music rights, refuse to let her play her own songs live or be featured in a documentary, she encouraged her fans to quote, let them know how you feel about this in a tweet. They took that to mean dox the shit out of them and their families. I I'm not defending these two sleazeballs. Scooter Braun is a manipulative dirtbag who has taken advantage of other artists like Demi Lovato, Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, and Adina Menzel. And the whole music industry being able to own the rights to an artist's catalog has always been ethically questionable. But it's also unethical to send your fan army of over 250 million Swifties after not just an individual, but their extended family as well. I assume Scooter's Mima wasn't personally hoarding her music like a Smaug dragon. <laughs> Swift seems to be unable to help herself from participating and treating her fans like more than just fans. And to a certain extent, I can kind of understand why. She seems like a decent enough person, minus dumping hundreds of tons of carbon into the atmosphere on her 15 minute private jet flights, and 
I have no evidence that she kicks dogs in the face and body for fun on the weekends. She probably in some ways feels indebted to those who have supported her emotionally and financially throughout her career who have contributed to her achieving the level of stardom she has today. If I ever got that rich and famous, I would also want to somehow pay it forward. However, they seem to think that they have a familiarity with her in the same way as her parents and friends who she's dating, less so, which again is due to her seemingly authentic vulnerability she shows about her personal life and past relationships where she writes songs about every single person she's fucked and then either dumped or broken up with. And because she's left Easter eggs in her music solely for her fans to discover, they are unable to interpret her words as being purely musical inspiration and instead pick apart every lyrical phrase to determine who wronged her and now must seek vengeance in the name of their god emperor. It's been a cliche for a while that she's going to release a breakup song for every relationship she has and I don't know why anyone would even risk dating her at this point. It's the story of the boy who cried wolf and Travis Kelsey is either actually a good match and is relatively well adjusted, or he really is just a big dumb meathead and the next target of musical exploitation. Shit, I mean, her fans are already speculating about their demise as a couple because he got mad at his coach during the Super Bowl, and they all said his toxic masculinity would be the catalyst for the inevitable breakup. I don't know anything about Travis Kels, and I've never done team sports, so I can't imagine the pressure these people are under at one of the most watched single sporting events in the world. However, I do know what it's like to be working towards something and trying to accomplish a goal and becoming overwhelmed when you fail or those around you aren't performing at the same level. Just take a look at how any group school project usually goes. As a young skateboarder, I would get frustrated when I wasn't landing a trick and would have similar outbursts where I'd curl the board 40 feet into the air and into some bushes out of frustration. Was that toxic masculinity? No. Feeling pissed off and unsupported by a team is universal and not governed by gender or sex. It was anger and disappointment in myself, and it was in no way hurting anyone. Except maybe a gopher I unknowingly concussed just going about his day. <laughs> Sometimes releasing that frustration by heaving a skateboard into God's country or yelling at your coach who's not doing his job is kind of part of the deal. I'm sure that's not the first time Andy Reid has dealt with outbursts from his players, and he probably wouldn't be a coach if he didn't know that was gonna happen. I mean, he was the head coach for the Philadelphia Eagles and probably got batteries whipped at his head from both the players and the fans regularly, so it's a wonder he's even still alive. With other celebrities, their fans don't always stick by their side so loyally. To cite another video, which you should go watch, I talked a bit about the public's reaction to John Mulaney's relapse and divorce. I didn't and still don't condone his behavior, regardless of his struggles with addiction, let me make that clear. But I did see a few fans express their disappointment with some guy they didn't know personally in regards to him divorcing and allegedly cheating on his then wife. Not only that, these feelings also ignore the fact that people in general are messy and complicated and make poor choices even when they're sober. I I'm not going to speculate on how Anna Marie Tendler felt or what she went through, but there's gotta be some part of her that is relieved to be rid of him, and she is objectively in a better place living a life without the toxicity of Mulaney's poor choices. This isn't me downplaying how she ended up there, but some of his fans' reaction had a real stay together for the kids vibe, which usually just fucks up the kids. It's like when a couple gets divorced and someone says, oh, how sad, without realizing they wouldn't have gotten divorced if the marriage was good. <laughs> That's the whole reason people get divorced in the first place, because shit was not going well and now things are way better because they aren't sharing a house with an abusive, manipulative, cokehead lunatic. Everyone should be ecstatic anytime a divorce happens. I'd go so far as to say their relationship probably wasn't great long before Mulaney's relapse. This type of thing doesn't just come out of nowhere and typically someone relapsing is brought on by external forces, which I can personally attest to. From from personal experience, when I was using and dating someone who I thought was the one, <laughs> when everything fell apart, I couldn't look at myself or her the same way. Your own despicable actions have a halo effect on those around you, and there's always a lingering memory of all the horrible shit you both went through when you look at them. Especially once you get your shit together. Y you might even realize you only really loved that person when you were off the wagon. Besides that, with a clear head, you might see how they enabled you or didn't offer empathy or support in a way that you needed or wanted, or you just see that you're no longer the person they fell in love with and being around them is triggering 
even if they did no wrong and were genuinely a good person. These feelings are valid for both parties and to try and understand what happened is an impossibility and honestly, none of our fucking business. It's hard enough to find the genesis of a breakup when it's happening to you, let alone by a third party who's essentially playing a game of telephone with clickbait headlines as their only source of information. Putting these people on a pedestal and thinking they owe you an answer for their crimes because you bought tickets to their show or their book is fundamentally failing to understand what function they serve as personas and entertainers. They don't owe their audience a single thing and to get triggered by the very sight of Mulaney on a red carpet is weird and makes their situation all about you. I hope John Mulaney knows how absolutely on site it is if I ever see him in person. I can never see this man's face without being reminded of what he did to his beautiful wife. If you look up the word Judas and pick me in the dictionary, this is the photo that's gonna come up. I cannot stand her either. One of the most common comments that I get are people saying, well, it's not our fault that you chose bad men and now you're bitter towards men. Please do not get it twisted. I've chosen pretty decent men, you know, in terms of, you know, they're still men, but they're decent. The reason why I can't stand men is because John Mulaney was my favorite comedian. You know who else was my favorite comedian? It was, you know who was first, my first place, my favorite comedian of all time? It was George Carlin and he's fine. But you know who my second favorite comedian of all time was? Louis C.K. It was Louis C.K. and John Mulaney. Those are my favorite modern comedians. And they betrayed me. In case you're new here, John Mulaney had a beautiful wife that he was married to for eight years. Pre-showbiz, pre-fame. She was really like, held him down when he was nothing. There's a lesson here if you don't already see it coming. Anyway, all of his specials is basically him saying, I do not want to have a child. I do not want to have a child. I have a wife. We are child free. We're so happy to be child free. I do not want children. I do not want children. I do not want children. They had a cute little dog named Petunia and they were happy with that. That was so much of his materials, how much he did not want children. He gets Olivia Munn pregnant while he's still with his ex-wife. Leaves his ex-wife to go raise a child with Olivia Munn. And it breaks my heart. Anytime I see him, I, I think of her. I think of her and how she must feel when she sees these photos. Can you imagine being her? and witnessing this. I just, it makes my stomach crawl anytime I see him. That dog that they shared together died last June. What was he doing last June? When this, when this dog that he shared with his ex-wife that was basically his child died? Celebrating Father's Day with Olivia Munn. Oh my God, it just makes me sick. John, if I ever see you, if I ever see you, if you have one hater, it's me. If you have no haters, I'm dead. This woman held him down when he was nothing. This woman held him down when he was a fucking crippled addict, okay? When he had a crippling addiction. When he was giving drug dealers weird neck massages in a seedy apartment in New York. That's when this woman held him down. <laughs> And he left her and is now happily sober with a child with Olivia Munn. And if you're a woman who's ever like, oh, pretty, pretty women get the, you know, our men can be taken by pretty women. It's so great. Da, 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 da. As a self-proclaimed pretty woman, I'm telling you, it's not great. We don't want these men. I broke up with a guy over John Mulaney because he came up. We were watching his special and he was like, yeah, you know, it's not right what he did, but I would have done the same thing. It's Olivia Munn. I looked at him and I was like, oh, oh. The nice guy facade that you had going for a little bit was just cracked. I see through it now. Please do not get a choice that I've chosen pretty decent men. So hold down, hold down a man if you'd like to. Shout out Haley. Hold down a man if you'd like to when he's on the come up and you will learn. I'm reminded of a time when I was hanging out with some friends where someone was talking about how their brother had lost his legs while in the military and what that experience was like. She said how he had a hard time readjusting and was suffering from depression for a while, but eventually made a recovery and turned this traumatic event into a positive thing by framing it as, at least I'm not dead. And a friend of mine who was there listening to this story got so emotional about it and could not move on from the fact that he had lost his legs and went into full breakdown mode, crying in front of this person who had just gone on about how he was now able to live his best life despite losing his legs. It was just so bizarre and they just could not comprehend that his life was good actually, even though he was now an amputee. It felt very selfish to be more upset than this man's sister or the man himself and be unable to fathom that someone could still be a happy individual after such a traumatic event. 
They made the whole thing about how they were feeling. It'd be like walking up to a random funeral and crying louder than the relatives of the recently deceased. What are you doing? <laughs> Mulaney's fans seemed to have a black or white mentality and rejected the nuanced complexities that make a person human. It really felt like they thought there was no room for redemption and lacked the ability to understand that even in unhealthy relationships, the two parties can reconcile over time and the constant criticism and media attention actively hinders their ability to traverse the road to that reconciliation. The last thing an addict or a person who has been emotionally abused needs during recovery is to be picked apart and dissected by parasocial fans who read way too much into everything they do and overanalyze interviews and social media posts like a World War II code breaker. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them secretly hoped he'd relapse again out of spite and probably had no idea who his wife even was before his relapse and divorce from her. The sadder part is at a certain point, audiences stop viewing personas as actual people and think it's okay to treat them as nothing more than oddities whose sole purpose is to entertain them where they justify pernicious scrutiny and say shit like, well, that's what they signed up for, as if that somehow absolves them of being afforded any dignity and respect as a human being. People were comparing his actions to that of Louis C.K., you know, the guy that committed actual sexual violence. They also go on to further defend their behavior like doxing and dogpiling by saying they're doing it in the name of or on behalf of his ex, but I don't think she asked any of them to do that. And if she had, like in the case of Taylor Swift doxing Scooter's family by proxy, it wouldn't make it better. It would absolutely make it worse. Parasocial fans love to fight a war no one but them are waging and the amount of collateral damage they can inflict is despicable. There's a stubbornness among parasocial fans who dig their heels into their delusion where their contempt turns them into an immovable object and they become just the most insufferable people on the planet. There's no difference between this mentality and when flat earthers try to prove their theories by conducting experiments that accidentally prove themselves wrong. The earth is flat. If he's holding it up at 23 feet high and we're seeing the light, well, that's because the earth's curved. So I, I should only be able to see it when it's at 17 feet. Enrique, how high is your light? 17 feet. I mean, I, you know, it's his, uh, lift up your, lift up your light way above your head. Interesting. In my opinion, one of the ways these parasocial relationships become so intense is how little media literacy and critical thinking skills and empathy many individuals within these groups share between them. From an absurdist point of view, no one should be taking comedians or musicians or actors this seriously by hanging on their every word and action. Unless they do actually commit, you know, a murder, then let's play ball. Searching for order or meaning in a universe, this chaotic is a futile and desperate attempt. For me, thinking about something for too long usually reveals how silly and illogical it is, like how we're the only species that have to wear clothes. What is that about? To set a foundation for this train of thought that's about to get really out there, absurdism is a branch off the tree of existentialism where existentialism posits that life inherently lacks meaning and it's up to the individual to infuse their existence with purpose and value. It emphasizes personal responsibility, freedom, and the subjective creation of meaning in a universe that is indifferent to us. Absurdism is similar in its belief about an indifferent universe, but emphasizes embracing the chaotic conditions of existence rather than trying to find meaning within it while not succumbing to despair or false hope of traditional narrative meanings like say religion or ancient moral epics. <laughs> Imagine the story of Sisyphus, but instead of him being sad or angry about his predicament, pushing that fucking rock up a hill for all eternity, he's laughing maniacally rather than sinking into misery. In the context of parasocial relationships, fans often attribute significant emotional importance and meaning to their imagined connections with people like Swift and Mulaney. This investment is an externalization of the existential mandate to create meaning. Instead of forging meaning through personal actions, experiences, or relationships, individuals turn to these one-sided attachments to personas as a simpler, more accessible way to fill a void when they should just chuckle about it and move on with their day. <laughs> well, 
everything sucks. You've got work and bills to pay and probably need to change the oil in your car. Who gives a fuck what a celebrity did or didn't do on national TV or behind closed doors? The investment in a parasocial relationship is a misplaced effort to find meaning in external, superficial sources. The very nature of these relationships is superficial. After all, they're built on meticulously crafted personas, edited content, and the controlled interactions of meet and greets that are designed to entertain rather than form genuine reciprocal human connection. Even if you feel a kinship with a celebrity, it's not the real them that you see on TikTok or Instagram or on late night. This is part of the observer effect phenomenon in psychology, which suggests that the mere act of observation can change the behavior of the observed. It's similar to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum physics. Yes, I'm talking about quantum physics albeit in a social science context. It's closely related to the social desirability bias as well, where individuals might alter their behavior to fit into perceived social norms or expectations when they know they're being observed. The concept of the performative self was proposed by sociologist Irving Goffman in his 1956 book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, which also touches upon these ideas. Goffman suggests that individuals perform roles in their social interactions, much like actors on a stage, adjusting their behavior based on their audience. The presence of a camera introduces an audience, real or imagined, leading individuals to consciously or unconsciously perform roles that may not reflect their natural self, like how cliched it is to flip the bird to a camera as a reaction in order to be perceived as cool. <laughs> if these people had a higher degree of media literacy, they might might be enlightened about the silly constructed nature of personas and the entertainment industry's mechanisms that merely serve to separate your money from your wallet. Absurdism and recognizing the effects a camera has on individuals would help them understand the superficiality of seeking existential meaning within what are ostensibly constructs. Critical thinking skills allow individuals to question and analyze the content they consume and the intentions behind media production, and thus the psychological effects of parasocial engagement. Absurdism lets you detach, making it less likely that you'll view parasocial relationships as carrying some existential significance. Stick with me here because it's about to be a long walk. <laughs> you could argue that red letter media are some of YouTube's biggest absurdists, and yet have no small portion of fans who completely misinterpret their sensibilities and satirical approach to content creation and media criticism. If you're unfamiliar, Red Letter Media are known for their candid and sometimes edgy humor and film criticism who occupy a distinct niche on YouTube. They've often been called your favorite YouTubers favorite YouTubers. They don't play into what's trending or pander to their audience and often make jokes at their expense, which on some level is probably a subconscious attempt to distance their audience from falling into a parasocial tiger pit. Hi! and welcome to the least creative comment section on YouTube. Check it out. Oh my God. That's the same shit they've been saying for five years. Their content is part disillusionment with contemporary filmmaking and a nostalgia for cinema's past, including some of the worst B movies you've ever seen. You thought Madam Web was bad? Try watching Repo Jake or Robo Woman or anything Donald Farmer has made. Don't actually watch it, that man's a pervert. <laughs> it's important to point out his fetish, there's no like actual nudity in the movie. Right. That's not his thing. His thing is watching women in bikinis writhe in the dirt. Spirits come in me. Oh, yes. R writhe in the dirt, really into sharks. Sharks, <laughs> yeah. And also vomiting. <laughs> They're not exactly bread tube. <laughs> but throughout their long career, have voiced their disdain of anti-LGBTQ agendas, performative corporate diversity, and have challenged mainstream ideas about consumerism and art. Have they made jokes in poor taste? Absolutely. Does this automatically make them racist garbage humans? No, and it shouldn't discount the valid and insightful criticisms they have exacted on society, culture, and politics, or their unique voice on YouTube. They've made progress over their more than decades long career of consistent creation. That being said, I do not recommend some of their earlier content to just anyone, and that doesn't even necessarily have anything to do with their ideals. Their overall style, isn't for everyone, but you know, what is? There will always be detractors and those with different tastes and that's groovy, baby. And they by no means try to force their opinions onto anyone. It's impossible to sell a single product to everyone after all, unless it's like 
I don't know, a toilet of some kind. Everyone needs a toilet. <laughs> this isn't a dismissal of some of their more, let's call it blue humor. And I'm not defending some of the things they've said in the past. I don't always agree with them myself. I see Mike Staklasa, Jay Bauman, and the incomparable Rich Evans as an interesting case of how a person or group of figures can develop two distinct camps of parasocial relationships. Those who lack strong critical thinking and media literacy skills who can't decipher satire, and those who understand what they're trying to say through their art, who even when they don't agree, realize it's fine that different people share different opinions. Red Letter Media, I'm a big fan of them, but they get stuff, like sometimes they'll say super sexist stuff, or sometimes they'll just get something completely wrong, or they'll just, and like, I am a still big fan of theirs, but they get shit wrong. Red Letter Media got pretty big on YouTube from their Star Wars prequel reviews all the way back in December 2009, and were some of the first people to start making video essays, which are now an established genre honor on the platform. You're watching one right now! The reviews were told through the perspective and sometimes literal POV of a fictional man named Mr. Plinkett who lives in a disgusting house filled with Star Wars memorabilia and who is obsessed with Totino's pizza rolls. He speaks in a nasally drawl as he offers in-depth analysis of the magic and horrors of movie making and his contempt for the hack fraud that George Lucas became. Throughout the reviews, he experiences psychotic breaks, has a shootout with police, and admits to fucking his own cat. I like to fuck my cat. <laughs> he is also very disappointed in his meth head son. He's meant to represent the worst of Star Wars fans, or any overly obsessed audience members. The reviews are as much about how bad the prequels are as it is a subtextual indictment on parasocial relationships. The reviews went viral among pop culture and nerd fandoms for their detailed analysis and for being what some might call divisive or nitpicky. It was picked up by major news outlets, message boards, and even actors and comedians like Simon Pegg and Patton Oswalt who called the reviews genius, saying, Mr. Plinkett can't say the word protagonist. He understands how a movie works, and he doesn't know what the word protagonist means, which is a hilarious combination of things. The prequels are awful, but they inspired a lot of amazing film scholarship that better films haven't done, which shows you the richness of the universe and how Lucas is squandering it. Benjamin Kerbach, a grad student from the University of Iowa, wrote a whole academic paper about them, who said in regard to Mr. Plinkett's video manifesto that someone would have to be crazy to watch movies the way Plinkett does, and his attitude implies that the film industry has induced a consumerist fantasy in people who don't watch movies this way. Plinkett's obscenity and jokiness are without a doubt designed to garner viewership, but they are also Staclaus' apology for, or defense against, a culture that already construes his level of passion as pathological. This central irony leads us to question what is actually more insane, the consumer who rejects the expressions of a massive culture industry, or the massive culture industry itself. Plinkett satirizes the kind of consumer such a system generates, psychotic, sexist, homicidal. I think it's important to note that the character of Mr. Plinkett has to some extent become intertwined with Staclasa and Red Letter Media as a whole. Many people knew very little about the channel when their review went viral and thought it was just one guy making in-depth movie reviews about a decades-old franchise that people had mostly forgotten by 2009. During the time, and into the following couple of years, the internet was a wildly different place. Edgy humor was the norm, and getting called a slur in a Halo Xbox lobby was par for the course, so they put out a perfect piece of content for the time. Shoot a gun, I dog. Learn how to the fucking shoot a gun, you fucking riot shield. What else do you want me to do? Oh, riot shield! I'm a pussy that use riot shield! Not to say that that excuses any valid criticisms of the reviews themselves, but historical context is important when looking at past media. It was cynical, petty, and full of disappointment where the saying, George Lucas raped my childhood, was embodied as three separate reviews culminating in a total running time of four and a half hours. I am fully aware that it also isn't really an excuse to say they were a product of their generation, but like in the case of John Mulaney's addiction, was certainly a factor. <laughs> Everyone, to an extent, is susceptible to being molded by the accepted norms of their time, and we can't ignore that. This is where I think the claims of sexism and misogyny were planted. Both the critics of Red Letter Media and their fans who were developing parasocial relationships with them 
couldn't fathom that Staklasa's Mr. Plinkett was a fictional conduit that allowed him to deconstruct the franchise and caricature the stereotypical toxic nerd culture fanboy. And I know some might argue that you can do the same thing without incorporating sexist rhetoric and jokes about dead hookers and pizza rolls, but it's that very incorporation of such topics that are abiding commentary on the psychotic cult-like behavior of fandom as a whole, especially Star Wars fandom. Exaggeration is one of the key elements of successful satire and almost a requisite to ensure that those without a sense of media literacy understand its unreality. Even when you bash people over the head with it, they still watch Starship Troopers and side with Nazis when the whole point of that movie was fascism bad. Even Roger fucking Ebert didn't seem to get it and we're still rehashing this with Helldivers 2, which is basically Starship Troopers the video game. Doesn't come free. <laughs> <laughs> Look familiar? There's a historical precedent to write these kinds of characters as a way to examine society and culture. There's a long tradition in literature and media of using flawed, morally ambiguous, or downright despicable characters to say something. Do we want to eliminate villains from our story and pretend that evil people don't exist in the real world because it makes you feel uncomfy? <laughs> Stories need some kind of conflict to be engaging and typically include a protagonist, an antagonist like Walter White from Breaking Bad. Initially, a sympathetic figure who starts as an emasculated, pathetic high school chemistry teacher who quickly spirals down a dark path as meth producer and literal murderer and becomes just the worst father and husband. Justice for Skyler. His moral descent touches on themes of desperation, power, and the consequences of choice. Walter's complexity challenges viewers to question their own values and the societal conditions that drive individuals to extreme actions like murder and manipulation and making meth in an RV with your Hot Topic sidekick. Within these depictions, there is purposeful provocation, which is often dismissed out of hand as cheap shock value, but when done right, serves a strategic purpose in satire that forces audiences to confront uncomfortable truths about the world and the people in it. In the case of the Mr. Plinkett character, when satire like this is successfully achieved, the audience can reflect on how such a character mirrors the darker aspects of fan culture. And we have to recognize there is a distinction between depicting problematic behavior for critique and condoning such behavior. Context and authorial intent couldn't be more important here, and to say stuff like, you shouldn't write characters that are sexist or racist or have any other negative attribute just sounds like you don't want to think about how these things unfortunately do exist in the real world. By talking about things like racism and sexism, we as a people can dismantle those systems of oppression and sweeping them under the rug just allows for those ideologies to fester and take root. Mike Staklasa is not Mr. Plinkett, and even when you see Staklasa on screen in other video series not as Plinkett, he's not really himself there either. It's a performance done for the entertainment of an audience, and more people need to familiarize themselves with separating the art from the artist. Otherwise, you just look like an uneducated and willfully ignorant buffoon. In rewatching the reviews for this video, I honestly wonder how much these people paid attention to what Staklasa was actually saying. Not only does he, as Plinkett, point out the cartoonishly racist alien designs, he goes on for several minutes about how creepy and sexist Anakin is. Excuse me. Interrupting. Excuse me. Losing temper. I'm sorry, my lady. Forced apology. So their next date is at the waterfall. Anakin tries to discuss politics and admits he supports a fascist dictatorship. <laughs> then he starts begging for sex. I will do anything that you ask. Next, Anakin murders women and children, brings a corpse home, and goes on a psychotic, megalomaniacal rant. Why'd she have to die? I will be the most powerful Jedi ever. I will even learn to stop people from dying. He's jealous. I killed them. They're dead. And the children, too. And I slaughtered them like animals. Prior to that, he discusses Lucas's cold, sterile depictions of love as one-dimensional cliches that lack any logic and rely on antiquated, childlike interpretations where Padme and Anakin are shoved into traditional gender roles. 
In the review, Plinkett compares Lucas to an alien himself trying to comprehend the idea of love after reading Romeo and Juliet once, which is ironic, considering that technically Padme and Anakin are aliens. So maybe this is just what love looks like in a galaxy far, far away. And for all the whining about sexism and ignorance to the use of exaggeration as a way to incite provocation as a means to reflection, this entire tangent about gender is, I guess, wholly unimportant to them and has no bearing because he said hooker a few times. It just comes across as a stupid performative act of protest over a piece of media anal sis they don't understand and stubbornly disregard, but then go on to write a petty 108 page rebuttal to that, if anything, proves Mr. Blanket right. It's also interesting to see two parasocial fan groups basically fighting over who is more correct-er. The Star Wars Uber fans who collect every stick of plastic Star Wars branded junk and cream their pants at the very idea of more movies and the bunker-dwelling red-letter media fans defending every word of the psychopathic Mr. Plinkett who imprisons women in his basement. <laughs> the irony of both of these parasocial fans endlessly arguing about how bad or good the prequels are based on a clearly satirical and absurd review making fun of those same people flew over both groups' heads like the Millennium Falcon making the jump to hyperspace. And while the prequel reviews made genuinely smart and insightful arguments, they also made jokes about this guy's face, which I think makes clear their intent to not be taken all that fucking seriously. The overall thesis was more about George Lucas trying to film his unfilmable rushed mess that was slapped together in an afternoon that ultimately lacks any soul and is a vapid facsimile of the originals that man children eat up regardless and defend to the death. George Lucas himself created an environment for his own parasocial fans to emerge who had built their entire life and identity around Star Wars and see the original trilogy as the product of his individual vision when that's just not the case. If it was, C-3PO would be an oily used car salesman and Han Solo would have been a frogman with a homunculus sidekick. Not only that, the entirety of Star Wars is basically lifted from several other stories and authors, from Frank Herbert's Dune and Isaac Asimov's Foundation to Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers serials of the 40s and 50s. Red Letter Media was critiquing the men who were still obsessing over what is ultimately a movie made for children, who Lucas then poured out the merchandising rights to toy companies and soda conglomerates for a quick buck. As the years progressed, Red Letter Media went even further with their satirical takes on cinematic universes and annoying fanboys by creating the Nerd Crew series that takes the piss out of detestable comic book sites like CBR and Screen Junkies who made their career out of praising every Disney franchise, who were probably getting paid under the table, no matter how dog shit it was. To put it in the words of Mike Staclasa himself, How embarrassing. All of this is to say that while Red Letter Media might not be the most tactful group of people on the internet, their passionate takes on the current state of movies juxtaposed with their cynical, apathetic proclamations is the humor that I don't think many people get. On more than one occasion, they have stated how Star Wars was a huge inspiration for them to get into filmmaking and appreciate that the movies did the same for others. What many parasocial fans don't realize because of that lack of critical thinking I've been going on about is that things are not black and white in terms of the personas you connect with in a parasocial relationship. You can love a thing and critically pick it apart and hate what that thing later becomes. Both can be true at the same time. It's also what makes them so interesting as influential media personalities. Pair all that with how small their digital footprint is outside of YouTube and how little they comment or correct audience interpretations, and you have the perfect setting for parasocial fans to speculate and assign their own meanings to Red Letter Media's content. As much as they poke fun at insufferable audiences and contemptuous, out-of-touch, tone-deaf executives like Kathleen Kennedy, they also make fun of themselves probably more so than the latter. If you're paying close attention, they are the laughing Sisyphus in an indifferent universe and the vitriol and anger lobbed at them is ineffective against their dispassion. They're looking down and laughing at the parasocial relationships some of their fans have developed with hysterical mirth. I think people who end up on the giving side of parasocial relationships mistakenly frame their perceived connections positively as they're always proselytizing about how a movie or song saved their life. In small doses, developing a parasocial relationship might give an individual confidence, reassurance, comfort, and feelings of acceptance, and I don't want to discount how people felt safe coming out after listening to Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. But there are more harmful aspects than beneficial ways these relationships can influence people, like 
deciding to join Scientology because you want some free sneakers and agree with Tom Cruise that psychiatry is torture and brainwashing. In the case of the toxic red letter media critics who misunderstand their humor, parasocial relationships can form around a collective hate for someone. You see it all the time, but for some reason don't associate these people as having parasocial relationships when it clearly is. To look back at the definition, it is a one-sided relationship where one person extends emotional energy, interest, and time into an entity or persona where the other party is completely unaware of their existence. We tend to read the words emotional energy, interest, and time and automatically associate it with having an amorous gaze. When you can express hateful emotional energy or have a spiteful interest or spend time in a state of lunacy picking apart the lives of others. People tend to write this off as someone merely being triggered and call them a snowflake, but that's an oversimplification when they seem to always be triggered. Another example of this that comes to mind are some of the disillusioned fans of the McElroys. There's an entire subreddit dedicated to shitting on every new project or gaffe they make in any one of their dozens of podcasts. How I didn't talk about them in my video on podcast is only now blowing my mind. <laughs> and these are three brothers, and their dad sometimes, who are generally considered unproblematic. But over the years, their fans have come after them for performative allyship, cultural appropriation, and gone out of their way to shit on anything that doesn't live up to the first season of The Adventure Zone and some of the earlier episodes of their flagship podcast, My Brother, My Brother and Me, some of which does have actual merit. In a way, the brothers brought this on themselves by setting a standard that is hard for three white guys to continuously live up to. Hell, it's hard for anyone to live up to that standard regardless of the color of their skin or gender or political beliefs. What's the quote I'm thinking of from The Dark Knight? Oh, fuck it. Audiences are already pretty wary when a white person ends up in the position of ally because so many of them have immediately turned out to be horrific monsters. What can I say? We can't help ourselves. It's good how inclusive they try to be, but people started to put a lot of stock into them as being one of the good ones. They've attracted some of the most unbearable and overzealous people on the internet and now roll out the guillotine over any minor infraction because they think any brand of comedy outside of the McElroy's goofy saccharine humor that has a mandated no bummers rule by the way is automatically hateful, oppressive, ableist, or misogynistic and is completely irredeemable and anyone making these nuanced jokes should be banished from society. Overzealous is probably putting it mildly. I'm trying really hard not to generalize, but so many of their fans seem to have the same mentality and disagree with the comedic adage, you can make jokes about anything and take that to mean punching down is okay when that's just not what it means. You can joke about anything. What matters is at whose expense. If a punchline to a joke about rape or 9-11 or AIDS, AIDS lands on the victims, that's a bad, lazy, distasteful joke. If the joke is about the perpetrators, have at it. I'd encourage these people to grow a spine and watch an Anthony Jeselnik special if I didn't think his jokes would collapse their empty fucking heads in. My point is, parasocial relationships are mostly bad and a slippery slope that leads to redefining your character based on the choices and actions of people who don't even know you exist and probably think of you less than their gardener or nanny who cares for their neglected children. More often than not, people are incapable of balancing between healthy and unhealthy obsession because they are sad and lonely or suffering from a traumatic brain injury and are unable to find meaning in their own lives on their own accord. To develop a parasocial relationship is to willingly surrender your agency and right to choose or be different. You are no longer an individual, but instead a singular unit among millions in a hive mind. I'll admit it takes a lot of work and brain power to critically self-reflect in a society that demands you assimilate to conformity. Trust me, I get it. Humans will typically do whatever it takes to feel part of something larger than themselves. And before the industrial revolution and the advent of the internet, it was a requisite for people to have this drive so they didn't get eaten by giant cave hyenas. <laughs> it served the function to associate and bond with a community or leader out of self-preservation. We were never meant to develop these feelings to the screen of an iPhone though, and we have yet to catch up to and fully understand the effects parasocial relationships have on our psychology. I'd like to share an anecdote to wrap this all up. A couple of weeks back, one of my subscribers recognized me on the bus as I was heading home from my day job. We were two stops away from where I get off and I was a bit taken aback because at that time I had even fewer subscribers than I do now and honestly wasn't expecting to run into someone who had seen one of my videos until like 
I don't know, the 100,000 mark? There wasn't enough time for me to engage with them in a more meaningful way, and I awkwardly thanked them for the kind words they offered about my video on addiction before exiting. The interaction left me realizing how even at such a small scale, I have probably more influence than the average person, and the things I say, especially with how vulnerable I was in that particular video, can have a real impact. Which is great, and in the context of that video was kind of the point. I've stated multiple times how if my story or insight can help even one person, I've done my job. At the same time, I can't ignore that there is still the chance that people might develop parasocial relationships with me, and I do run the risk of enabling that in some way, whether it's intentional or not, just by posting my thoughts online. I don't want to come across here like I think I'm too big for my britches, or that my audience is having a panic attack every time I upload. <laughs> But I think it's also important for me to examine how my presence online is growing and choosing to actively participate exponentially increases the odds for this to become a possibility. I'm just trying to express a little self-awareness here. With all that being said, I appreciate your encouragement and engagement, and please keep it coming. Your support makes the likelihood that I could do this full time a real prospect, and I hope that you stick around even when you may not agree with everything I say or relate and I want there to be some kind of respectful dialogue if, and let's be honest, when I get things wrong. I want to learn and grow and experience a little humility, and I don't know how to say this without sounding insulting, but I don't know you and never will, but that doesn't mean I don't like or appreciate you. I've tried to take steps to limit the ability for strangers to contact me as a way to mitigate the possibility of unintentionally encouraging parasocial relationships, including not replying to every comment and DM on Instagram, which I have already failed at spectacularly. <laughs> it just would be kind of irresponsible of me to not take steps to prevent the thing I just spent an hour probably criticizing from happening. And look, I'm not gonna sit here and say all this without admitting that I myself have done the same with creators on this very platform and other media personalities who I look up to and have inspired me. We all get lonely and we have a safety blanket to crawl under sometimes that's made up of actors and musicians and authors. I was obsessed for a period with the entire cast of Parks and Rec when it was on and still catch myself scrolling through actor Instagram accounts thinking, man, they're just so cool, I wonder what they're doing right now, before snapping back to reality when I realize it's 3 a.m. and I have work in six hours or I'm gonna hate my life for eight more hours. It can offer an escape for a brief moment in time and it's fine to fantasize every now and again, but I just encourage everyone to not let yourself sink into the superficiality of a parasocial relationship because in the long term, it's just a waste of time that will leave you feeling unsatiated and more empty than before you start to speculate on the inner lives of Robert Pattinson or Zendaya. You'll come out of a fugue state and realize years of your own life were spent showering attention on the lives of others. I don't really have anything funny to sign off with in this video, so I'll just say thank you, and you're all unique and special to me, even if we never meet. It feels crazy for me to ask people to like and share and subscribe or go follow me on Instagram after all of this. <laughs> so I'll just say thanks for watching and until next time. Vanish. <laughs>